Good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome you again to our lecture series, the United States and World Affairs, the Cold War and Beyond. Our speaker tonight is Professor Federica Bindi, who is a leading expert on transatlantic relations. I'm Klaus Lars. I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in sunny Chapel Hill. <laughs> I would like to thank, as always, I would like to thank our generous sponsors for making possible this lecture series. And I would like to remind you of our YouTube channel. As always, I would like to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free and please watch all our videos as often as you possibly can. They're all great and exciting to watch. And of course, today's talk will also be on the channel within a few days or at the latest within a week. That's good. Ever since 9-11 and the difficult wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the great economic recession of the recent past, the newspapers and TV stations are full of talk about American decline. People are wondering if U.S. global leadership has come to an end. While the 20th century was the American century, it doesn't seem to look as if the 21st century will also be one dominated by the United States. In Europe, the situation is no better. Ever since the economic recession of the recent past and the still continuing Euro crisis, European integration and the EU seem to be a project of the past rather than the initiative that will shape the 21st century. In the foreign policy realm, the EU has only recently begun to focus a little bit more on becoming a player in international affairs, but not always successfully, as for example the crisis with Russia about Ukraine uh, shows. Still, it might, it might be way too early to discard the United States and Europe. Both continents and powers have been declared dead and irrelevant several times before. <laughs> In fact, every 20 years or so, analysts love to talk about American decline and the end of, trend, of the transatlantic relationship. But it is by no means certain that the future will be shaped by China, India, Brazil or other rising powers. Perhaps there still is some space and some room left for the United States and Europe. I'm very pleased that Professor Federica Bindi has come to UNC tonight to enlighten us about all of these issues. Federica teaches at the University of Rome in Italy. She holds the Jean Monnet Chair in European Political Integration there. She also is a colleague of mine at the Center of Transatlantic Relations at the School of, at, uh, um, of Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. It has been most complicated, however, to get Federica to us tonight. She was originally scheduled to come in uh, February, and the snow interfered, and all planes from D.C. were cancelled, and we were snowed in, as you remember, for quite a few days. And then, today, we thought, well, now the sun is out, it's spring, nothing can happen. Oh, no! The plane, which was meant to go to Raleigh and RDU, got instead sent to Greensboro. And Greensboro is not that close, so we were running out of time, but a quick taxi ride managed to get Federica here, and I'm uh, very grateful that she arrived kind of five seconds ago. <laughs> Federica is an expert on Italian foreign policy and transatlantic relations, and she's a prolific writer on all, almost all things European and transatlantic, and one could say she has published in many, if not most, Western languages. In 2008 and 2010, she was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, that well-known think tank in D.C., and before this she has been a researcher at the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs in Oslo. She was at the, at the Free University of Brussels, at the University of Lisbon, and also at Sciences Po in Paris. And that is, I'm just naming a few of the many prestigious institutions she has worked and researched at. Professor Bindi has also been very active in politics. She has been an advisor to the Italian foreign minister, and for example, she was a fellow in the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee when it was still chaired by John Kerry. As acting director of the International Relations Department of the Italian National School of Public Administration, and then as director of its um, international training, she led the Italian efforts for civil reconstruction in Afghanistan. She also coordinated the Italian training program for Afghani diplomats and civil servants. Federica Bindi definitely leads a most active scholarly and political life. It is also a great pleasure um, to have her here at UNC today and to enlighten us about all her expertise on the United States and transatlantic relations. 
Today she will talk about the end of global leadership, question mark, why the United States and Europe are doomed to irrelevance. And I wonder whether there should be a question mark as well or not, but we will find out. After Federica's talk, there will be plenty of time for questions from you, the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Federica to UNC tonight. Thank you, Klaus, for this most generous introduction. You make me blush. And I do not hope to enlighten you, but I do hope to provoke you a little bit. And let me say up front that I don't think that the US leadership in the world is ended. And, and you know, you and myself are both proof that we still believe <laughs> that this country has a bright future in front of, in, in front of it. But uh, I do, however, think that there is a need to rethink the US leadership and probably somehow go back to the origins to regain influence. Now, um, why do I say so? Now, the first thing, remember, you know, we, we are all not completely youngsters, so I guess you all remember when the Berlin Wall came down. Our students, they don't. They have no clue. You know, when we talk about the Berlin Wall, they have no clue. So, if you want to show them, we need to show pictures, you know, movies, documentaries, because it's the world in which we have been growing up, all of us, is not there anymore. Uh, but somehow, that is still a fundamental moment in international relations. And what happened there, how had, that moment had been interpreted, and what, ha what happened afterwards, still shapes foreign policy today, and in my mind, still leads to the confusion in which we are living. So to, let's try to go back with, with our minds to the Cold War period. You know, it was an understandable situation. It was, there was a clear pattern of product, productivity, pre, productiv, pre, okay, <laughs> you understand. I mean, we, we knew what to expect. You know, the scenario was more or less fixed. And we had stable alliances. Everybody knew where they fit in those alliances, whether at the individual, individual level or state level. And there were clear rules. All, uh, above all, the principle of non-interference, which itself somehow is a derivative of the Peace of Westphalia of the 1600s. So the Cold War was the product, the ultimate product of a system that had been in, 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 uh, that had been in place for over 400 years, and it was a place where it appeared where we knew where our place was. You know, to the extreme consequences. You know, just to break the ice and tell you a joke, in Italy, you know, we were divided between communist and anti-communist, and that were two separate worlds. We would hardly talk to each other, we would shop in different places, we would learn different languages. You know, you knew where your place was. You knew, you knew what you wanted. And this, it's, it's a little bit more complicated today. Then, 1989, the, uh, the Berlin Wall comes down. That's an epic, pro it's an epic moment. And for Europeans as well, that was an epic prop, a moment. You know, I remember I was, I was at the time an exchange student in Paris, and we had this, this uh, professor who was an expert in German, in German affairs, Alfred Grossel, and was giving a conference every week, and you know, commenting, because since the summer there were lots of things going on, the Austrians opened their, their borders, you know. So he was giving on, on, uh, on November 9th, 1989, he was giving a conference, he, uh, and it was about to close, and they said, you know, maybe 10 years, 20 years, maybe things change, communists will be not there anymore. And in that moment, the, what we call the apparatur, you know, the, the people who stayed at the door, came in and said, we just came to tell you that the war fell down. You know, still today, it gives me a, a very weird, a happy and very weird sensation. You, you should imagine this amphitheater with 2,000 kids screaming, clapping, crying, you know, were full of Germans, cry. I mean, it was unimaginable. And we had no clue, unless you were a communist leader, youth or older communist leader, and you had traveled on the other side of the world, and you had seen selected things from the other side of, of, the, of Europe, we had no clue. I remember I was in a youth organization, and we went, and we went to, to Budapest, we went to, to visit to Prague, 
And you know, we didn't have to learn to understand each other. We, we, although many of the people in the Eastern Europe spoke English, but they didn't give the same value to the words as we did. It was a fascinating time. A few years after, fast forward, a few years afterwards, I started, I started to do my PhD at the European Institute University, and I started, to be a, I started teaching, and I started teaching in American programs. And, and, the, and it puzzles me because the students, you know, which at that point still remember, still lived that, through that, was that, they started to use the expression, we want the Cold War. I was like, wait a minute, nobody Cold War. Nobody want the Cold War. So we started researching, and we had two sets of completely different expressions regarding that event. In Europe, we refer it as the end of the Cold War or the fall of the Berlin Wall. In here, we refer it as the time when we won the Cold War. The perception of that event and what would come afterwards is completely different here and there. We have completely different perceptions. So in Europe, the reaction was end of the Berlin Wall, end of the Communists, we are going to integrate. You know? And that came not without problems, as we would see. Uh, in here, the, the consequence was we won the Cold War. The USSR at that point was dismantling and in deep trouble. Then what the American leadership derived from that is we have a duty and a right, we are the only super remain superpower, we have a duty and a right to lead the world and intervene. All right? And the USSR left plenty of space for that. Europe also left plenty of space for, for that because Germany had to be reunited and Germany was a leader, but it took some time to absorb that. Then there was enlargement to Eastern Europe, which was very hard to manage, and you know, recovering. So, the, from the East, seen from this perspective, you know, we were absorbing our own problems, and and the, and the U.S. was was uh, was um, was uh, able to express its leadership. You may you may have noticed that I tend to say we both when I talk about America and Europe. <laughs> that is not schizophrenic, but <laughs> that is what I am at the end of the day. I belong in both places, and and I feel I belong in both places. So, but this is how it worked. Then, Iraq War won, invasion of Kuwait, the first Iraqi war takes place. And that's a splendid moment in international relations. Because for the first time ever after World War II, we are all, all on board. The first one to endorse the, the, the American reaction to, to the Kuwait invasion is Gorbachev, uh, Gorbachev leadership. So, for the first time, we say, okay, there is, there is an invasion on a sovereign country. This is not admitted under UN chart. We're, go we're all going to punish the invasion. All right? USSR and US on the same side. That is huge. That is the end of the Vespalia system we have been living for the last 400 years, which was based on the principle, which was the same principle of the Cold War, mutatis mutandis, that you know, you have borders, or you have a sphere of influence, and no one puts the finger in the other, in the other superpower sphere of influence. Remember Prague, remember, remember Budapest, but also remember Latin America. All right? So that, in that moment, we think that there's, gonna, there's not going to be war anymore. We're going to live in a peaceful place which also leads to the, to the idea that maybe NATO should be dismantled, just like the Warsaw Pact has been dismantled. What do we do with it then? No, we don't dismantle it. But the Iraq War, First War, it's also the end, for the second time, of the European ambitions on European defense. The Europeans had tried to create a European defense community in 1952, but then the French closed that history in 1954. Then one of the reactions to the end of the Berlin Wall, to the end of the Berlin Wall, was to to say, okay, yes, to united Germany, but in the context of the stronger Europe, and the stronger Europe meant economic and monetary union and the political Europe, including defense. And that is one of the things on which there is there has been since a very strong U.S. ambivalence. 
in the 1950, in the 1950s, the U.S. was completely on board on the idea of European integration and completely on board on the idea of European defense. But because why? Because that was seen as strengthening Western Europe vis-à-vis -vis the U.S. USSR. But in the 1990s, the situation is different. You know, the U.S. as I said start to perceive itself as the only superpower. Huh. Yes, on the ones, and this is an ambivalence that is still there, and it has to be solved. It has to be solved. Because you can't have, there is a saying it, and you can't have the, the, your wife, you can't have the, your canteen full of wine and a drunk wife. <laughs> All right? That's, that's what we are asking. We are asking for the Europeans to pay more of their defense share. That's fair. But then, when the Europeans try to pull together, oh, we don't like it. That is number one ambivalence. That, in the end, is going to weaken the U.S. Because one of my points is that the U.S. is strong, but it needs a strong ally. And there is no better ally than Europe, whether we like it or not. We have the same values, the same rules. The U.S. needs a strong ally, included a European ally, included in defense. So why, why that shatters this second attempt on European defense? Because the British and the, and the, British and the French divide. And that is clear that defense is going to go nowhere. We have done something, but there is, we are far away from that. Also, in the 1990s, it starts a competitive process between European integration and NATO integration. Why? Because, because as I said, one of the reactions in Europe was to say, OK, we, we want all these Eastern European countries, Central Eastern European countries, to be integrated into, into Europe. But you know that has a cost. You know, Europe is not a federation like the U.S., but from many points of view, is more integrated than the U.S., especially when we talk about the market. So whenever a country becomes a member of the European Union, it has to implement the so-called acquis communautaire, the whole body of European laws, right, that have been produced in the last 70 years, almost 70 years. So it, it's a big process, and it has a cost. So it's not even easy for a country. Plus, we have to decide who gets what, how much money you give you, how much money you, you, you get. It, it, it's complicated, all right? So Europe, yeah, we wanted them in, but you know, there were lots of problems. Uh, so we start, Europe started you know, like Penelope while, while she was waiting for Ulysses, you know, sewing during the day and unsewing during the night. And, and then the Clinton administration saw an opportunity there. So they stepped in into the, into the NATO, NATO process and offered NATO membership to these countries, uh, which led the Europeans to rush. And that was an Italian, an Italian president of the, of the commission, which rushed the, the entrance of all the members in 2004 before the process was finished, leading to a number of problems which took a while to, to set. So, but anyway, just to say that this process is not that not been so harmonious. Also, one of the things which I discovered when I came here, there is a narrative that is self-taught by the then administration that it's NATO, it's thanks to NATO that those countries developed economically and democratically. And that is a big mistake. Number one is not respond to facts. All right. Uh, of course, being part of NATO was a big plus. But first of all, the money, most of the money, were put by the European Union. But this is not even the most important thing. By saying that it was thanks to NATO that they developed democratically, we are just assuming and sending the message that democracy can be exported with weapons. And this is the one thing that we have learned in the last 20 years, it doesn't work that way. I mean, if you compare the, the waves of democratization one after the other, it's democracy can only be, can't be exported, it can be encouraged and helped, but only at the condition that there is a deep and shared desire by the elites and by the, the citizens of the country to establish democracy. We can't export democracy. I mean, there is only one case of 
partial success, which is East Timor, which is a tiny city at the end of almost a little more than a tiny city, and even there, it has worked. So this narrative leads us completely out of the way, and it's a dangerous narrative. And I would say, on the contrary, it has been the major success, no, 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 not I would say, I mean, there's plenty of research, including myself, my own one, of course, that enlargement process has been by far the most successful policy of the European Union over the last, over the last years. So this is a very big mistake we're doing. The result of all this is that, and then, and then of course, the USSR changed into Russia, the Yeltsin period finished, Putin came back into, 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 into play, and Putin has a clear goal, restore you in Russia domestically and restore its place internationally. And that's the other thing that we lack here, the historical perspective of foreign policy, and not only in Europe. Whether we like it or not, whether in a country whose major strength, and I like it, it's the ability to look into the future, the ability to think into the future, you know, we want to buy a house with my husband. And we are talking, we are talking with this real, realtor and the amount of possibilities that you have in taking debt, in, in indebting yourself here. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You know, if you look at it from European perspective, this is totally nuts. You know, you don't spend unless you don't have the money. All right? But here, you do spend. And, and it's, but it's positive. Because, you know, you take debt. Why do you assume the risk of taking debt? Because you have a fundamental faith in the future. All right? So this is a country that looks ahead. Europe is a country that looks behind. And we walk on the weight of this, of this, of this, of this history. You know, you go to the Portugal, the most tiny little village in Portugal, you ask them which is the most important life for Portugal. It's Britain, of course because we have had a, a, an alliance for the last 600 years. You know, ask any fisherman, and they know it. So the weight of history in Europe is, have, is huge, hereby including Russia. All right, so they have a clear perception of themselves as an empire. And that has to be taken into consideration. Because just like we get offended here when people challenge American supremacy or our American exceptionalities, they get offended when they challenge, we challenge their point of view. And that has, that has to be taken into, into consideration. So the fact that Russia came back as an actor, of course, has made the, the scenario far more complicated. <coughs> and we don't know anymore where we are. So the result is that in the last few years, I say, we have a zigzagging foreign policy. In Italian, I would use the term, which is Mosca Ceca. This is a game that you do. You, Fold your eyes, and, and all your friends are around you, and you have to go around and try to find them and, 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 and guess who they are, right? So it's zigzagging foreign policy. Now, number one principle seems to be the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It doesn't really work that way. But this is, seems to be one of the, of the principles on which we have been founding our foreign policy in the last few years, all right? Now, second, how the American administration judge a foreign policy? That was very interesting when I was in government. A foreign policy of a country is good or bad according to whether this country is doing what they're told or not. A foreign minister is good or bad according to whether he obeys to what comes from Washington or not. And trust me, the Europeans are so happy to obey to what comes from Washington. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. If, the, the, if you read the same news, if you analyze this, they, the Europeans are basically convinced that the American administration, the State Department, spend all their energies in thinking about that. It doesn't work that way. But, you know, it's, so it's, it's a complicated relationship, but it's a fact that for the American administration, a good foreign minister is the one who, or prime minister is the one who obeys, and on the European side, they're so very happy when they can have a pat on, the, on, on their shoulders. You should have seen when the Biden administration came into place. It was embarrassing in Washington. People were, you know, embassies were doing everything they could 
to be the first one. It's like, pick me, pick me, I'm the one. I, I have the ocean <coughs> presidency, I have the EU presidency, I have what? I mean, it was embarrassing what the embassies were going to go through to be the first one to have a pat pat by Hillary or, or, or Obama. And I was like, you know, what's advising number four in me? It's like, why do you want to him right now? She doesn't know what to tell you. I mean, she's just got into the job, but you know, you have to go there and show that you were there. And the current Prime Minister of Italy, for instance, is going to come after 15 months. It is really, it really stink on him, right? Then the third thing is, as compared to uh, to 10 years ago, or or even less, there are deep divisions in foreign policy. One of the things that struck me most when I arrived in the U.S. And I arrived during the period of the Republican administration, and I was working at a Democrat institution. So I was expecting a high level of criticism, especially in closed door meetings, vis a vis the Republican foreign policy. And it really struck me that no, this is not the case. But this is, at the end of the day, this is one of the strengths of this country. You know, we have debates, and then we set for, a, for, a, for, a, for, a, for an objective, we set a direction, and then the whole system goes towards that direction, right? Now, this doesn't exist anymore. There are divisions between the Republicans and the Democrats. That's healthy. There are but there are divisions between Congress and, and the White House. There are divisions between the White House and the, and, the, and, the, and the State Department. There are divisions within the White House. So it's, you know, it's very blurred and very complicated. And the it, look at the look at it, look at the Iran policy. You know, we, we can go into that. Right? I mean, it's it, it's one of the examples. You have so many different voices and so many different ideas. So it's different. It's difficult to really say where where we're going. Then um, the other thing which strikes me strikes me as as an analyst and not only is we have this idea that in, in Europe, that here in the US, the policies are based on analysis. That there is a strong correlation, a strong link between what scholars think and write and what is an actor. Forget about it. <laughs> Forget about it. I, I mean, most of, my, most of my friends, this is a total, but you know, it, it's reality. I mean, there is a discussion in the disciplines. Why is the discipline not? Why is the political science and international relations does not influence foreign policy? And, and when you look at the people that go into administration, you know, they're, they, they're expert, yes. But they don't work, most of the time, they don't work on the areas where they have expertise, especially in foreign policies. This is freaking me out. <laughs> I have friends who are experts in European affairs, and I'm sure you know them, and they've been working, what, on Libya. A friend of mine was talking, you know, you know, I got there, and you know, there's all these things in Europe on which I would have plenty to say. And they gave me a book with Libya and said, you know, 10 days, a week, 10 days, you'll be an expert. Well, and there are plenty of examples. I mean, it's, it's anecdotal, but it's a reality. I mean, this, this, there is still people going in and out between academia or, or think tanks and, and, and administration, but it's not, this is not based on expertise. And their expertise, at least it's not based on expertise as it was you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And their expertise is not often not used the way it should be. So at the end of the day, the State Department is becoming like, like many European foreign ministries where you have very few people, the expertise is what it, it was it is, and you just go on instead of fully analyzing the options. Um, then Europe on its side. Europe has lost any relevance whatsoever. As I said, most of Europeans are so eager, especially since Obama is, is, is in, in, uh, in, in power. You know, if Obama had to be voted in Europe six years ago, he would have been elected with 80% of the votes. And they're so, so, so eager. In the, in the past, the Europeans at times supported the Americans, at times they did not. But there, were more, there was, if you, you know, think about the Iran crisis, you know, 
uh, or the, uh, the, whole, the old relation with, with the Middle East, the Europeans had more of a say. And that was, some, uh, that was uh, healthy. Now the Europeans really are lost. You know? And we have this Lisbon Treaty, when, uh, which created a EU high representative. You know, the first high representative, she was not an expert of foreign policy, guess what, because the, the, the member states didn't want a strong one. She had to create the whole, the whole structure, so it was a hell amount of work. So the first four years were transition. And now we have a new uh, EU foreign policy in, um, uh, high representative in place, which you know, I was pretty happy about her now, but all she's doing is traveling. You know, being a foreign minister is not being the frequent, number one frequent flyer in the world. I mean, the amount of, of miles you fly is not an indication of how good you are as a foreign minister. And that goes not only for Mogherini, but it also goes for Hillary Clinton, I should say, that if you read her memories, the, the thing she takes pride of is how much she flown. I don't care how much a foreign minister flown. I care how much a foreign minister or a secretary of state achieve in improving the world we are living on. So I see her on the frequent flyer mood, and I, I, I'm starting to lose hope that she will she will bring any difference. And what else? Going back, going back to. Uh, to, uh, to Hillary, and more or less, it will be, and here we go in the perspective, it's going, to be to be, it's going to be really interesting to see what role foreign policy will play on the next elections. Uh, very interesting. Of course, it will depend on who the candidates will be, but my feeling, my, uh, it, it could be a play a role, especially if Hillary is, is the Democrat candidate. Uh, you you see you see actors, you know, getting you you see what what the Hillary people in foreign policy have been writing in the last years and months. You know, the dean of our of size, the first thing he did, got out of got out of the administration, is writing a, a book saying that basically saying that Hillary got it right, Obama didn't understand anything in foreign, in foreign policy, the whole Ukraine crisis. Woo, who were the people behind the idea that we should weaponize Ukraine? Oh, this is all Hillary people, you know, which are saying we want a we want a strong a stronghold. I I see some interesting stuff coming up. Iran, <coughs> ah, Hillary statement was not the warmest statement I could think of. <coughs> so I can see foreign policy becoming an issue of 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 debate, at least within the Democrats, which. Could be good, but it could also could also really harm, really really harm the country standing in, in the world because it would weaken our position. To conclude, I think we we have two options in front of us to strengthen foreign policy. We have to decide whether we want to go for a realist foreign policy or an idealist foreign policy. My impression is that President Obama has tried to do both. And to some results. I mean, Iran, if you think about it, Iran, Iran is very interesting. The backside story of, of Iran. I can go into that afterwards, afterwards if you want, probably switching that off <laughs> before during the discussion. But uh, I mean, he's been moving alongside the two, the, these two partners with two, the, these two uh, paradigms with some result. I see Iran as one, as one of them, but it gives an idea of an unclear path. Now, if we go towards the realist path, you know, we have to decide what we value more in foreign policy. And the answer would be, of course, we value for more peace. Now, remember that during the Cold War, it was a realist, a realist period. Uh, we had peace. But there were also some local wars, some local, some local uh, uh, dictatorship. So total, we, didn't, we didn't achieve total peace in, uh, during the Cold War. So rather than peace, we should say the minimum number of cas casualties, right? And these are ca ca minimum number of, uh, of victims and maximum level of freedom. So we, in the Western world, we lived in peace. It's not for everybody. Uh, then we have to decide, you know, 
what are the areas we want to, what, what, what do we value about most also in, in terms, what, what, where is the threat coming from? From my point of view, and probably this is also because I'm Italian and I geopolitically see the world from different places, ISIS is a huge threat. ISIS is a huge threat because it's physically becoming near, coming near and near to Europe. Uh, one of the questions we'll have to face is what about Syria? I mean, ISIS is conquering parts of Syria. It's not that far from Damascus. What is worst for us? Assad or ISIS in Syria? I mean, we have to face this question. We have to face this question. There is no way out. The problem with ISIS is that not only challenging <coughs> physically our, our security, but it's challenging the very foundation of our, of our culture. You know, people not putting up posters, refusing publicities because they're afraid of offending the Muslims. It's, you know, one thing is making sure you don't offend anyone. Another thing is being afraid of, of someone. It's, it's, it's really tricky. Idealistic foreign policy, that would be my choice. In, pre, in theory, in a, in, a, in a splendid world. For the major problem with idealistic foreign policy, a foreign policy based on an idealistic paradigm, is that we need consistency. You know, we can't move war to a country saying that they do it for human rights and women, and women rights, and then our best ally is Saudi Arabia. <laughs> You know, where women cannot even dry. And I loved the first, I, I loved Michelle Obama when she went to the funeral of Kid Abdullah and she didn't cover her head. That was such a political statement, you know, from a woman point of view. I, I, I really liked it. But face this, you know, we, our best ally is one of the worst, worst perpetrators of human rights in the world. You know, people look for consistency. You are, probably most of you have kids. You know, when you are my sister, she yells all the time. And she has sisters. <coughs> I mean, what do they take out of it? If their mother is yelling at you not to yell, what are they gonna take it out of that? Right? And this is what we are doing. We are telling people we're doing things because we want more respect of human rights, and our allies, and in some parts our sense, are the first one to be, to, uh, to not respect them. Second things, it would mean rediscover soft power. Uh, the reason why Klaus and myself are here is because of the US soft power. I mean, this is completely underestimated, and it's been one of the biggest failures of when I was in the, in, in the Senate, uh, luckily it has changed a little bit. I try to advocate for more money for international students, for foreign change. I mean, the US was a fair, at least to our generation, you know. It, it was the country we looked at. It, it, the power of attraction of the US was huge. And there was an effort a concrete effort, especially after the end of the Cold War, to bring the best scholars here to the US, to have them do their masters and their PhD, some of them would stay, some of them would, went, went back. And that was the big power of the US. And even when I proposed that, I mean, the last thing in my face is that appropriation legislation on education, on international education, forget about it. But this is what the US has and nobody else has. So we have to go back to recapitalize, to, to recapitalize, to build on this, to spend money on this, because this is really what makes the US unique and the pole of attraction. And yeah, and then the democracy, I, I already told you. So we, I think we have, in conclusion, and then we can go to questions, I think we have tough choices in front of us. We really need to decide where, where is our place in the world, where is, when I, where is that we really want to go, and how we can achieve it. And my point is that we're not gonna achieve that through military weapons. At least that are there, can be useful, but it's not what is gonna, gonna make the US the most important actor in the world for real. You want people to love you, you want people to be attracted to you. That's how 
we express influence. And that not only comes from Wales. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's hope your sister is not going to watch our YouTube video. <laughs> I thought about that the moment I was saying that. Before we open it up to questions from the audience, let me just ask you a couple of questions myself. Um, the EU, a global player or not yet? When you look at the EU's role in its relationship with Russia, particularly over Ukraine, they've played both a bit of a positive and also a bit of a disappointing role. Or how would you judge the performance of the EU in that crisis and perhaps more globally? Now the problem with the EU is that it's, it's divided. I think mean, that the book we're publishing together, I, we did a, I did a through and I asked a number of scholars to analyze the foreign policy of a number of countries. And the picture you have is a schizophrenic picture. So Europe is deeply divided. And Russia is one of the areas on which it's deeply divided. Uh, the, reality, the reality is that Europe is still partially dependent on Russia. Number one, the reality too is that it's a neighbor. And, and, it, and it does matter. But it's a splendid example of how the European, some of the countries had one kind of interest, some of the countries had other interests for historical reasons, you know, namely France, Germany, Italy, where are the pro-Russian countries. For historical reasons, for economic reasons, some others, the Eastern Europeans, are anti-Russian also because of historical reasons. Some other have a tail on their back, the Baltics. You know, they know perfectly that the way they're treating their minorities, the Russian minority, is outrageous and put them at risk. So it's good to blame the Russians, while instead they should equalize the rights of the Russians and minorities. So they, we have all different sort of, of interests. And, and then we have the American administration, which went pop, in and popped. And so the, as, a result, as a result, the conduct of the European Union has been wishy-washy, you know, and <coughs> irrelevant in the end. Right. You know the um, uh, new foreign representative of the EU quite well, I understand. And initially, I remember an article you wrote which was highly positive. Now you've changed your mind? I know her well, and I, I was highly positive about her, and uh, people scoffed me for that. And I must say, I'm disappointed. That would be that would be the word. I'm disappointed from many points of view. Uh, the one number one, as I said, she's doing she's replicating exactly the same scheme she had when she was for Italian foreign minister: travel, 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 photo op, photo op, photo op. And as I said the most important part of foreign policy. We know as scholars, because we study it, especially in historical perspective, is not what comes from out of the photo op. Actually, the most important deals in foreign policy are the secret ones, are the ones on which you work in silence. And so this, this, uh, this I mean, it, it, and, and she's already into, into, the, into the loop. You know, her speech, her first speech in, 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 in Washington when she first came as Italian foreign minister was an accent speech. Last time she came as a, as a EU foreign minister, it was EU blah, 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 you know. And, uh, and then I must say I didn't particularly appreciate the way she dealt in managing people. Uh, that is probably a micro analysis, but you know, little things. You have your, se your outgoing secretary general, right? who has been ambassador in Washington, very highly regarded. You're coming to Washington, and you don't bring him. You bring his successor, who's just an advisor to you. This is misrespect of the people when, when we knew that he wanted to come, you know. The foreign policy community is what it is. I mean, this is misrespect. Iran negotiations. There was a clear out-out that the person who would be dealing with those negotiations was Kathy Ashton. Kathy Ashton has there are mixed comments on her work. But one thing that nobody, nobody doubts is her incredible ability to negotiate. She's really good at negotiating. The Serbia Kosovo agreement was completely, I mean, it was really, I, I know well the people who negotiated alongside, I mean, it was really her who did it. And Iran was the same. And then at the last minute, Mogherini steps in for the photo op. She doesn't even say thank you to her. 
I mean, these are little things, but it gives you it gives you the special, the deepness of the person, and I found it that rather disappointing. Okay, thank you. One final question for me. Uh, your analysis of the current state of transatlantic relations. You said in your talk that the Europeans always say yes to Washington. But is that really still correct? They may have been correct in the 50s and perhaps in the 60s to some extent. But now, are we not seeing a much more independent Europe, both in economic affairs, regarding Russia, regarding TTIP, many things, no? They say no initially, then they get the phone call and they're changing their mind. <laughs> <laughs> the pat, the pat, pat. Uh, Even Angela Merkel? <laughs> Angela Merkel is an exception, but it's also the only true leader we have in Europe. That, that's one of the problems we have in Europe. I mean, where is the leadership? I have a number of dear friends who are prime ministers and it freaks me out. You know, I love them, you know, as friends. But and many of them are very nice people. But, you know, it's be the leader of the country, especially in a complicated time. It takes, it takes knowledge, it takes expertise, it takes something that I don't see except for her. I mean, so she, she's the only one standing out, and not by chance she was the one going to Russia try and, and, and uh, bringing, bringing Hollande along and, and securing the ceasefire. But the fact that she stands out doesn't mean that Europe is there. I mean, it's actually the fact that she had to go bringing this, uh, along the along, it's an image of the failure of Europe as such. And again, Mogherini was completely sidelined, and then she made the statement, we are a team. No, you're not. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> Well, thank you for your optimistic statement. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open it up to questions from the audience. So, yes, the lady right here. Do you need Mic a microphone? No, no, I don't okay, think speak so. Speak up, please. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is this a particularly difficult time in the world? I know we had world war, but it seems to be very spread, different uh, needs from different parts of the world, is this more than you've seen in the past in all your studies? Well, the, fir the first thing... Africa that, included. You know, the first thing that differentiates this, this period from other periods is that it would take very little to blow up all of us. <laughs> now, during the Cold War, the ability to blow up others in massive numbers was in the hands of few people, of few countries and deterrent, you know. So it was, as I said, it was a fixed scenario where you knew where, who were the players and, and how they related to us. I mean, we went near with the, with the Cuban crisis, but, you know, it was a more fixed scenario. Now, to begin with, many of the weapons, deadly weapons, which belong to the ex-former USSR, some of them are God knows where, probably in Middle East somewhere, in rogue states, in the hands of people who, who would, would be very happy to use them. All right? And this is one more reason to me why we should have an alliance with Russia. I mean, I, I'm, I, from that point of view, I'm very clear. I mean, we, we need to stabilize as much as we can, and we can't do that without the Russians. But, but Russia is our enemy. How can we have an alliance? <laughs> That's what I said. We have to decide what, what is our goal. What is our goal? Uh, Russia, they don't share our values. That's, a, that, that's true. But many of our allies, starting with Saudi Arabia, don't share our values. Actually, they share our values much less than Russia. Yes, Putin is probably a dictator. I mean, it's still better than, 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 than Saudi Arabia again. And we feel for the Russians. We would like them to live in a perfect democracy. But guess what? It's their problem, really. It's, it's a country, Russia is a country that never had democracy. And as I said, it takes a long time. The East European countries had had a liberal, a liberal regime before World War II. So they had a remittance sense. They were smaller and they really wanted them. The Russians care less for them. I mean, I'm ashamed to say, but they are countries which are 
less attached to the level of democracy than we are in this country or in Britain. You know, their democratic development is it's less mature. And uh, to make a war of principle against Russia, and yeah, Ukraine, it was not saint what they did. But let me say that Ukraine is not a saint itself. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about baby, you know, we're not talking about uh, the Red Cross. We're talking about this corrupt country, which had been doing of corruption its main business for a long time, and which has plenty of faults as well. So, do we really want to put the world at risk for the sake of Ukraine? <laughs> that, I mean, that's a question, Mark, that we have to ask, ask, ask ourselves. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, being a corrupt country doesn't allow anyone to invade you, does it? <clears throat> well, you do have a problem with minorities. You do, I, I think that the solution of a federation within, within Russia within Russia is, uh, it, it is a good solution. I mean, a solution based on the South Tyrol example or something like that. I mean, are we gonna die for a, uni for a strong centralized Ukraine? Look, I mean, this, what is coming from, from Middle East, what is coming from the northern shore of the Mediterranean is scary and is dangerous. It's so little controllable. You know, it's, uh, it can really blow us up. And we need Russia on board, whether we like it or not. Okay. You know, there was a period where in the US you used to say, it's, it's a bastard, but it's my bastard. We have converging interests. We have, let's put it like this, we have bigger converging interests with Russia than divergencies. And the situation is, it is, is explosive. Explosive. All right, thank you. Welcome more. Yes, you mentioned the principle of non-interference and not, and not meddling in internal affairs as the principle of the Westphalian peace and also of the Cold War. But now exactly this is happening. The principle on which post-war Europe is built, the principle of territorial integrity, is challenged. And Russia has been challenging it. In the history of irredentism, whether it's South Tyrol or anywhere else over Europe, is the history of war and bloodshed. And if this principle is being violated, Western Europe has to stand firm. And to my knowledge, the sanctions are in place. And Greece and Cyprus, who could have vetoed, did not veto. Because the principle of territorial integrity cannot be violated, not inside Europe. Whether interests are shared or not in Afghanistan or in the Arab countries, I think does not touch upon that. If you allow people to just hold referenda, whether they want to join another country, Europe is gone through the window. <laughs> No, I don't agree with you at all. I, I completely, completely disagree. If the people via referenda choose that they don't want to stay in one country, that's a will that has been expre expressed. And uh, <coughs> Europe has been a place where there's been bloodshed, right? As you said. And if I mentioned South Tyrol, you know, South Tyrol, you know that north and northeast part of Italy used to be Austria. For a long time, and then it was incorporated very strongly into Italy and Italianized under fascism. And then, when when the, when the republic came into being and democracy came into being, it became a place where bombs were 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 thrown. You know, I, I still remember as a child going to ski in, in that area that there were valleys you would not go as an Italian because it was damn dangerous. They could kill you, for God's sake. Of course, today the weapons are also different, but it was it was a bloody situation, and it's only by giving by giving a higher level of autonomy within the country that the situation was that the situation was changed, and and this is I think is what we should env envisage for 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 Ukraine, and and I, but again, I, I'm I'm sorry I'm 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 really from that point of view, but again we have to understand we can't fix everything. And we have to decide what is the lesser bad for us. What is that we really want to achieve and, 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 can, and can achieve. And, and also you have to see things from a Russian perspective. Not that I'm justifying the fact that Putin is there, but you have to see them from their perspective. There was a clear understanding 
when there was enlargement, a gentleman agreement, unwritten gentleman agreement, that when NATO was enlarging, that it would not enlarge beyond the current borders to the east. All right? Now, at the time, Russia, USSR and Russia couldn't do much about it. So they took that agreement with Yeltsin, Clinton-Yeltsin agreement. Then what? Then the Bush administration started to push forward incorporating Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Now, NATO is based on Article 5. In the principle that if a country is, uh, is, uh, is attacked by another country, we all have a duty to respond. And when Georgia and Ukraine didn't get the roadmap, people started to, you know, oh, they were desperate about it. And then guess what? what remember what happened with Georgia? You know, who moved first? So it's a... Uh, and the war method. So the, to the Russians, what the war we had given them that we would not expand beyond that border has been, has been, has been taken away. Then there was a reset. Then they start, we started again. When, there was, when Kerry came into place, they, they, start, they started working well. There was a first reset with Biden, and then the second reset with the so, so, with, with Kerry. And then here we are all again. I mean, it would be completely nonsense to have Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. It also devalues the value of the alliance. I mean, it's and it's unfortunate. Yes, I know it's unfortunate, but it would be more unfortunate for, a, selfishly speaking, for a bomb attack in Rome or in Washington. These are people which have our weapons. We said, these are people, don't forget about it, that were trained by us. Many of these in ISIS, some of the leader of ISIS. So we have to make a decision, by us or by the Russians. So only working together we can defuse this. And we have to do it together. There is no way. This is, sooner or later, something bigger will explode. Thank you very much. Anyone else who would like to comment on or talk about Russia and Ukraine and you, yes, please. Um, uh, just to, to take this this conversation a step further, are you uh, basically suggesting that um, the U.S. was needlessly provocative in ex ex in ex expand in its eastward expansion of NATO, and that might perhaps account for some of Russia's aggressive posture under Putin towards Ukraine, Crimea, and other peripheral countries? I I'm saying. In a way, in a way, in a way it is. I mean, the, there, was, there was a clear understanding there. And any European leader who was involved in that at the time would recall it. Any of the American leadership who was into, into, the, in, into that agreement, don't forget, don't, don't recall it. That's, you know, kind of odd. And uh, how it comes here in Washington, you know, there was, there was a, people lost their memory and in Europe everybody remembers it. There was an understanding. And the word counts. If, remember that the, the, the biggest crisis we had during the Cold War, the Cuban crisis, was solved thank, thanks to a gentleman agreement between Kennedy and Khrushchev. All right? If we give a gentleman agreement and we step back on our words, then there is no trust anymore. We can't negotiate. And, and, and it's going to become completely messy. So, yeah, we broke our words and we are paying the consequences. And of course, Putin being less accountable to the people and, or, or, and also being the people more <coughs> reactive. You know, foreign policy is a... Is a is a united issue in Russian foreign policy. I mean, I have plenty of friends or people I know that were completely anti-Putin because he was not democratic, and they're all supporting him now. So we're not we're not we're, we're not weakening him. We're reinforcing him from from many points of view. But you know, we, we take away the basic instrument of foreign policy, which is mutual trust. Thank you. Anyone who would like to comment further on the issue? Yes, the gentleman over there. Yeah, I find you very refreshing, and thank you for coming. Uh, what, I, what I wonder about is, I hear that the, the Muslims or the Islamists are coming into Europe. 
and growing inside of Europe, particularly in uh, Belgium and, and uh, England and some of these other countries, <coughs> France. Do you foresee when they will take over? Look, I'm not saying Muslim. My best friend is Egyptian and he's Muslim, so I don't have any problem with the Muslim as <coughs> such. Uh, I'm talking about radicalists. Islam, Islam militants, which is a completely different, different history. Any decent Muslim will tell you that this is not real Muslim. So I'm talking about people who are radicalized, and why are they radicalized at the end of the day? How that began, and that's something that I, that I completely forgot, uh, that I wanted to say and I completely <coughs> forgot. If you want a more peaceful world, we need a, we need a, a world where, where the uh, wealth is more widespread, right? Yeah. If you if you are poor, you don't really have options. You're more likely, or you feel rejected. You feel you don't fit. You're more likely to radicalize. And this is what's happening. People that they don't fit, whether it was in Boston, whether it is in Europe, they go there, they radicalize, they come back, they're time bombs. Now, they uh, you know that there is this issue of illegal immigration crossing the Mediterranean Sea. That had stopped at a certain point because there was an agreement between the Italian government and Gaddafi. So we would, <coughs> so the control would have done, or that would have, would have taken place at the Libyan borders. Libya explodes, illegal immigration is starting again. Now, there is investigation done, done by the police, not by <coughs> by the magistrates and police, that this legal, illegal immigration is today into the hands of ISIS, which are making a profit out of it, and which are using it to ship people back into Europe. So it has happened already. We had at Paris, we had at Denmark. It's just a matter of time that will happen in over and over in other countries, because this is so difficult to screen. And, and, and that's one more reason why we need more cooperation among civil, uh, among secret services, U.S. and Europe, take the Paris case. You know, these people were known to the U.S. secret service and not to the European secret service. How nuts is that? And, and, and Russia. I mean, we need all on board. And we need everybody on board to, to work and bring wealth to those countries. And, and also, I mentioned Libya. Libya is a case in point. You know, we over, Gaddafi was ridiculous, was gross, was everything he wanted. It was not a democracy, but you know, he had the country open up and, 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 and it was, had become, we had worked hard to make of him a more reliable person, so to say, in a lie, which had solved some of the problems. We have overthrown him, and guess what? Libya is in complete chaos, most in the hands of ISIS. Iraq is the same one. How many years did he have war in Iraq? We told ourselves when we withdrew the troops that we had brought democracy to Iraq. Whoa! Did we really? Are women better off today in Iraq than they were before? I wouldn't think so. Actually, Iraq was a pretty secular country. And the next is going to be, if we don't find agreement with Russia, if we don't react together, the next is going to be Syria. And then, what? And then, and then it's gonna, after Syria, it's going to be Lebanon again, which is on the border. And Lebanon and then Syria are, are neighboring with NATO, by the way. I would like to point out, because Turkey is a NATO member. So it's, it, it's, it's complicated. We are here. We don't, really, we don't really feel it, because we are far away. But it won't take long before some of these people will blow up in, in here again. Thank you. It was a question. Yes. Of the gentleman over there. You talked briefly about the distinction between military power and soft power. And I thought a fascinating example of that was an interview I heard on NPR just last week relating to the Iran nuclear negotiations. And they had the, a nuclear physicist from MIT who was involved in the technical uh, negotiations. Yeah. And interestingly, the person on the other side of the table was a student of his in the 1980s at MIT. So we have 
And then, exactly. you know, we have relationships that can work for us or can exactly. work against us if we... Exactly, exactly, exactly. That was the energy secretary speaking on NPR. Mm -hmm. I listened to that, to that conversation again with an MIT, MIT <laughs> professor and it was brought in into the negotiation, the last leg of the negotiation to deal with the technical issues and the leading negotiating, the negotiator on, uh, on the other side was a former student of him. But even Zarif, the foreign minister, is someone who had been living here for 20 years uh, and know this country and love this country. And, you know, this is seen from a European country, people, from a European perspective, people, or a broad perspective, people either love or hate the US. There are so many stereotypes about the US. And especially when people don't know it. When people don't know this country, they tend to rely more on the stereotypes and, and, and on the hate side today. Before it was not that way. Before it was that people hated, but there were lots of people who loved the US. Now it's so much less. So we need more and more people to come here. More people who go to school here, more people who you know, get embedded into the culture, because this is how we build bridges. And that is a splendid, as I said, it's a splendid example. And yeah, if Iran negotiation got, got to where they are, it's completely thanks to soft power negotiation. Thank you. Any Not soft more? power, I mean. Any? Yep, the gentleman. Speaking about Iran, do you feel Iran will abide by whatever negotiations is agreed upon? They have an interest in doing so. They have an interest in doing so, which President Obama splendidly explained both on NPR and uh, and the New York Times. They, they have an interest, and uh, and and as Obama, I, sh I share Obama's view that I do believe they have an interest in doing this. But even if they didn't, we, we're better off in still doing do, doing doing uh, in, in, in doing an agreement. Again, Iran. It's a complicated and fascinating country. And uh, so the negotiation play domestically there, just, my, just like they play domestically here. Mm -hmm. And there is a moderate, more moderate leadership, which replaced Ahmadinejad today in place. And we want that leadership to be reinforced. And, and this, so blowing up the agreement would be, you know, blowing up the leadership and going to hardcore Amanikhtinejad style Iranians. But I do think I do think they will obey for that because they are they're a very especially the elite, they're a very cosmopolitan uh, elite. They they like the Western style of life and the sanctions are biting that. So they have a deep interest in uh, in, in, in abiding to the to the negotiation. Thank you. You haven't said a word about China. We have a talk here on Thursday about China, whether there will be military conflict. Um, but what is your view? Is China really the future and is the US suffocating by its own difficulties? Iraq, Afghanistan, domestic economic difficulties. So is the US on the way out? Not irrelevant, of course. It's too big a country for that. But is it declining and China is rising? And is shaping the 21st century. You know, we heard the same story with, the, with Japan 30 years ago. The US was declining, Japan would buy everything, and, uh, and it and eventually. Then, then it the Rockefeller Center. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, so, so, so what? China, China is buying pieces of world. I mean, it's buying Europe, it's buying here, it's buying you know, in, uh, in Africa is building on an army. Uh, it's a huge country. I also add I'm not a Chinese, a Chinese specialist, but my, my point is that we share nothing with them. We have no single, one single value that we share with them. Great relations. Is that a value? That's an interest. It no, it's an interest. It's value is it's democracy, it's human rights, it's respect for the people, diversity, minorities. We, they have no values. They have interests. And we, we share interests. That is completely different. It's a completely different thing. And uh, so they are becoming an actor want to be aware, but again, it's one, the fact that China is rising, it's one more reason why we want to be together with the Russians, with whom, at the end of the day, we share more than we share with China. <coughs> 
Because you want to give Russia to China, or what? Well, thank you. Let's uh, listen to Michael Hunt over there. I was gonna, I was gonna raise the question. I mean, to follow the, the line of argument you were making, and I, mean, I think if you take an even broader view, move out from the transatlantic view, uh, you know, move into the Middle East where you have rising powers, regional powers at the very least. Russia talked about China. I mean, the world is getting more complex. I mean, and that is one of. The, I mean, in a sense, if you want to argue, you could argue '89 is not the moment globally. But this kind of gradual change from the, maybe the 70s onward, you know, where we've had more and more centers of power, either economic or, economic or, or military. And so I think this, is, you know, if you go back to your original point about the U.S., you know, this, this really poses a, you know, a very difficult problem for the U.S. in the sense that the world is complex, as you were, as you've been, you know, repeatedly, the point you've been making repeatedly. And so how does the U.S work as a leader within that more complex world. I think the other theme that you've been playing on is this kind of realism and the difficulty of having a kind of analytic, realistic U.S. policy and the way that kind of eludes a lot of people with inside the beltway. And so I think that, you know, what, what, what you could argue is that there's really sort of a persistence of what I think Ernest May used to call it an axiomatic policy, you know, that, that there's a certain set of principles we follow. U.S. leadership, we don't want to be challenged, we want other countries to follow, follow our lead, we want to impose values or promote values where we can. You know, let's don't worry about the details. But that's a point of view that's operating within a world that's much more complex than it's ever been and much less responsive, I think, than it's, than it's ever been. Yeah, no, and so in some ways I would be more pessimistic, I mean, I would, I, would, I would push your point in a more pessimistic direction that you're, you're sort of leaving it open and saying, well, maybe we can manage or confront, Americans can manage or confront this complexity. And listening to public discourse today, political discourse, I mean, I, I, just, don't, I just don't see that, that happening. You're talking about a Hillary Clinton on the one side and a, a group of Republicans who in the main follow a kind of revived Interventionism, I guess, would be the simplest way to put it. A stronger interventionism than Clinton would would, would follow. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the Republicans, most of them, they say the few ones. I mean, like Kane, for instance, is definitely an expert on foreign policy. Uh, one may sh not share his point of view, but they certainly know his stuff. But there are some Republicans in, uh, in Congress that really have no idea what we're talking about. Really have no idea of what we're talking about in, in, foreign, in foreign policy, and they're oversimplifying, and they don't, see this, uh, they, don't, they don't see this complexity that you're talking about, which is, which is, which is clearly, clearly a problem. No, you, I mean, I completely share your point. I agree with you. I mean, the, these axiomatic points you talked about are all true. The problem is that we brought every, everybody behind our leadership in one disaster after the other. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, this is one disaster after the other. And, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated. Well, that always is a good statement for an academic. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> DJ Martin. Well, before you, we leave, would you um, give us a little inside perspective on the uh, Greece and its uh, situation and who the actors are and what is the likely result? And are there any real serious consequences or departure from Greece from the Eurozone? No, I don't, I, don't, I, don't th I don't think we're going to have a departure of Greece from the Eurozone. It's going to be interesting to see what happens, what is tomorrow, mm -hmm. that uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister is traveling to Russia, which, you know, have historical ties because, you know, they're both Christian Orthodox and, and so on and so forth. listen to you. Uh -huh. The Greek Prime Minister listened to you. He does? Yeah, of course. An overture to Russia, to Putin. <laughs> 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 so they, they, so it's going to be interesting what, what happens. Look, what worries me most, to be very sincere, in, the whole, in this whole history about Greece, is when they ask money for a preparation for the war. That is what really worries me. Because that means you know, opening wounds that you don't want to open, that is out of place to open now. I think that Germany has overpaid for its original sin. The current leadership has nothing to see 
nothing to share with that leadership, so it's unjust, dangerous. It, that is, of the whole thing, this is what worries me most. Because it's gonna open revanchist, uh, a revanchist discourse in, in Europe that is not gonna stick only there, but it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna widespread around. That is, of all, the most dangerous thing. And that is really what, you know, he should be told that's enough. Enough is enough. That's not, not respectful, it's dangerous. So of, of all things, this is what, what worries me most. And frankly speaking, the fact that the British Museum had many of the Roman and Greek artifacts saved them. So <laughs> I'm talking from you know perspective of a country which has huge, huge, uh, huge riches from their point of view, and we have no clue how to, to deal with that. So, but that of course they wouldn't like to hear. But no, that that is really what 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 worries me most. But. Going back to that, I, I take I take this this question, if you don't mind, to to go back to the issue of expertise. One of the other things when I was there, I succeeded when I was in Senate, where I had a very deep discussion, an ongoing discussion with my colleagues who were in charge of European economy. economy. I, I was on politics; it wasn't, they were on economy. And their point was that if the euro collapsed, we were talking about 2012, that wouldn't harm the U.S. And I'm like, you must be nuts. <laughs> you know, people, they say, no, you know, the euro collapse is good for our experts. It's like, you don't understand, this is going to be a disaster. So there, it's an success because we eventually managed to organize a closed doors meeting between Kerry and the Secretary, Assistant Secretary of State, I think, and Assistant Secretary of Treasury at the time, if I remember well, and that came to an end. But that, that also tells you about the, the lack of expertise, if you want, and the lack of, of perception that we sometimes deal with in taking our decisions in foreign policy. If you close this off, I will tell you the Iran story. Mm -hmm. Well, we do that after a minute. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any more final questions? Otherwise, I would like you to ask you one final question. If you were the incoming Secretary of State under the new administration, what would you do to save the country from disaster, if you like, to make it more relevant, to make it maybe better for global affairs? First of all, it would freak me out. <laughs> one, thing, you know, one thing is advising, analyzing, and one thing is having to take the decision and live with the results of those decisions for the rest of your life. And so, um, th that being said, I would definitely Definitely. I mean, and assuming the Congress would follow me, you know, assuming that I could tell this is what we do, and you follow me, guys, and you give me the money. Uh, as I said, I would, I would definitely, definitely invest on 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 soft on soft diplomacy, more money to exchanges, education. Not only people coming over here, but Americans going abroad. There's more and more, but the problem is that most of these Americans go abroad and stick to American programs. What? Yeah. You know, we can change that by subsidizing those who go to study in European or Chinese or whatever universities. Because going, moving from, I've been teaching in those, in those universities. If you, teach, if, you, if you go to school in American university abroad, you're still abroad. You're still picking. You're still among Americans. It doesn't, yeah, you do some nice tourists, but that's not the point. We want more people to really understand the cultures, to really understand what is the weight of culture in other continents? What is, you know, the language? What is so? I would invest in income and uncommon. That that for sure. That would be my number one number one priority. And and second priority, I would tell the Europeans hard face. That's another failure when I was in Senate. I would I would tell the Europeans hard face that I'm not gonna do, deal with you on a one by one phase, uh, basis. I'm gonna deal with one. You decide, you want to send me for a minister, send me for a minister. You want to send me the U for a minister, send me the U for a minister. At that point, they will have to choose someone who's really able to represent them. When, uh, the, it's actually on Wikileaks. If you go and look, if you go and look on Wikileaks, it's funny because I found my name on it completely by chance. I was looking for Bindi Pittsburgh and I found that Wikileaks cable. Uh, here's the story. I hope it was an interesting revelation. No, it, it is interesting. It's very well done cable, I must say. And uh, this is the story. When, when the Obama administration came into power, 
Phil Gordon, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs and besides an ex-colleague at Brookings, went around for a, for a tour of the, the capitals. And he basically asked one question. And the question was, what are we going to do when the Lisbon Treaty comes into effect next year and, and we're going to have a EU high representative? And the, the cable in, a, in object uh, consider, uh, concerns Italy because the, what the foreign minister Frattini told him is like, you know, you can't expect to talk on a one to one basis on, with Europe because we don't have diplomatic services, it's completely in Europe. So, you know, the first period will be more a setup period. So you have to be patient, but this is the direction where we're going. So he was very pro-European. And then we have a second meeting with, uh, with Massolo, the Secretary General, and you find it in the table. I was very happy to find it. And what Massolo says, nah, 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 yeah, we will have the European, uh, uh, European External Service Action, which is the name for the European diplomacy. But you know, the real actor is going to be the nation states. Now, because the US has a uh, has a, a leverage on Europe, I think the administration should simply say, you have the instruments, use them. We're not going to talk with every single one of you. Decide. If the Americans talk on a one to pretend to talk on a one-to-one -one basis with the Europeans, the Europeans will have to live with it and will have to unify more. I mean, at the end of the day, the American administration was behind many of the biggest steps. But what about the honor tradition to divide and rule? rather than <laughs> pushing the Europeans exactly. into something. <coughs> isn't it, uh, in exactly. the, isn't it in the interest of the administration to talk to Europe with different voices? That's, Two different voices that goes Europe. back into my main point. We have to decide what we want to do. We want to go on and do these petty little things among Europeans. But, but doesn't want that to mean you give the US the responsibility for the Europeans to get their act together? Doesn't that have to come from the Europeans rather than from the US? It should. But sometimes a little push is helpful. You know? If it is in the interest of the US, is it? But it is in the interest of the US to have one unified actor to speak, like one strong European actor, rather than 29 fighting Europeans. I am. I'm positive. I'm positive. Yep. So, my name is Barry Chamberlain. So, Germany leading from the center then, outward, or? How is that going to work? With who's going to be, who's going to be the economic superpower in Europe at this time? You know, the economic super, the, the biggest way economically is, cert is certainly is certainly uh, Germany, but Germany not necessarily wants to be. I mean, if you look, if you look at the pattern, wants to be the main actor in foreign policy. You know, and take this round. They were excellent candidates. We had we had car built. We had uh, the for the Polish foreign minister. These were strong, strong foreign ministers. If they had taken, probably the 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 Polish foreign minister would be more divisive. But someone like car built would have been a splendid EU foreign minister, right? Now we choose Federica Mogherini. Fine, you know, as I said, I was very fond of her. But come on. She's been a foreign minister for four months. She doesn't have a leverage. She was clearly accept she was clearly selected. Well, first of all, because Matteo Renzi made a big fuss about it and threatened the veto. But in the end, they will accept it because she was a weak actor. Because they wanted a weak actor. The same reason why they picked on Kathy Ashton at the beginning. You pick someone who no has no clue on foreign policy, so not only she will have to build up everything, but she will also have to learn. And she's a quick learner, and she did it. But so the Europeans still don't want to have the foreign policy because they want a little pup. Because being seen together with, with Kerry I mean, makes, means that you matter internationally and, uh, and, and then you use it in domestic politics. But the problem is, a united Europe, disunited Europe is going nowhere and is of no use to the US. It's no use to the US. So they were, if, if, you, look, if you look at history, of European integration. In, behind many of the big steps, they, they were the US. ECSC, the US supported it. Dean Ashton, so the Secretary of State of the time, strongly supported it. They were the first country to open an embassy in Luxembourg. EEC, the same. So 
If the Europeans don't decide themselves, I think the US should push toward that direction. And if I were the Secretary of State, I would totally tell them, okay, there would be a big role that they have to deal with. That. That's a clear agenda. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very, very enlightening and provocative talk. And don't, don't run away because Federica wants to let us into a secret. But no, 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 I mean, I don't want to. Well, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I would just like to mention, before we come to your secret, I would just like to mention we have another talk coming up this Thursday uh, by Graham Allison of Harvard and a former, uh, I think, Under Secretary uh, of Defense. And uh, he will talk about the United States' relation with China and whether or not there will be military conflict. So a highly interesting and topical issue. Please come again this Thursday, 5.30, in this very room. And thank you for, to Vederiga for enlightening us today. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Is it on?